Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. I'm happy that we're practicing together. So we'll begin with a guided meditation. We'll start by just coming into the body, recognizing that we're here at this moment. And maybe in a global way, I'll just check in, how is the body? Maybe it's feeling a little bit tired or maybe a little bit restless or a little bit achy or a little bit spacious. Maybe you're not quite sure yet. However it may be, it's all welcome and invited. Doesn't mean it matches our preferences, of course, but we don't need to exclude or push away our experiences, but to make room for them and allow them to be here as best we can. And feeling connected, grounded, feeling the pressure of the chair, the cushion, the bench, the couch, whatever you're sitting on. Feeling the pressure against the body. And then checking in with the posture. Is there a sense of evenness, a sense of balance? Sometimes it's helpful to rock back and forth a bit. A little bit of an adjustment. We all know how uncomfortable it can be if the we're not sitting just right, then we find ourselves squirming or just simply getting up and abandoning it. But to feel the uprightness and the balance in the posture. And then to allow the attention to rest on the sensations of breathing.
and feeling the inhales, feeling the exhales as the chest moves, the belly moves. And to every now and then just check in with the body in a global sense. Just noticing the posture. Are we leaning forward? Maybe we're slumping. Maybe our chin is up. Without making it a big project, but just feeling into the body, maybe the body as a whole, seeing if there's a sense of balance. If you find that your shoulders are up, or maybe you're leaning forward a little bit, we don't have to make it a problem. We just very simply bring our posture back into alignment, into balance. And if we notice that repeatedly we're leaning forward or our chin is up, we might just get a little curious. Is there a mental state that's associated with this physical expression, this physical movement?
Some people, sometimes when their chin is up, they're doing planning. Leaning forward, it's a little bit of striving. Feeling slumped, collapsed is maybe lost in fantasy or lost in some kind of thought. Maybe a feeling of dejection or disappointment, sadness. Being sensitive to our posture. Can be another way in which we can be aware of our experience, our inner experience. Maybe the mental state Maybe our emotional state. We might not be aware of it until we notice the shift in our posture.
So finding the balance in our posture, in our body, can help us notice when we're a little bit out of balance in the mind. Maybe there's a lot of wanting, this leaning forward. Maybe there's some collapsing mentally as well as physically. Maybe there's a lot of planning and or striving. We don't have to make it a big problem or make a big project out of it. We can just very gently bring the body back into balance, allowing perhaps the mind follows, and perhaps the mind is already there. But using the body and this idea of balance as a support for our practice. Help us not to be out of balance. So that we can take care of ourselves and take care of others in a way that's appropriate. So in this way, our practice is for the benefit of all beings, not just for ourselves, but for those we come in contact with and whom they come in contact with and they come in contact with, etc., etc. So may all beings be free from suffering. Welcome, welcome, a really warm welcome for everybody. Wherever you are, whomever you are. Sometimes when we listen to a Dharma talk or give a Dharma talk, there's this tendency to approach them with our cognitive minds. I know that certainly is the case for me sometimes. I've been reflecting on this and for many of us who have had a profession or just enjoy kind of like solving problems, figuring things out, uh, acquiring knowledge, understanding it and creating models from the data that we get or I know that uh, my years as a research scientist uh, I used to love that so much. Love that when the to get the data and like, wow, okay, now what does this mean? And put together the little pieces and there's so many different ways in which we might uh, do this whether we're actually doing experiments or not. And so of course, of course we or sometimes we'll bring this type of thinking or this type of way of being into the way we approach Dharma talks. 
either giving the Dharma talks or uh, listening to them. Trying to, might be a way, like if we're listening to them, we might have this idea that, okay, just if I just take in enough information, if I understand it, if I can make all the little pieces fit together, nice, neat, and tidy. Or maybe if I can, the sense of, okay, if I just have to get everything straight, now how does this relate to that? And what precisely is the definition of that? And and this energy of um, trying to figure it out, and this feeling, this maybe leaning into, well, if only I just had it, all the information, then I could do this Buddhist practice thing. I could do this meditation thing. Of course, it's easy for us to fall into that type of thinking when we have it probably in so many other areas of our lives. And in some ways and sometimes that type of approach of figuring it out or acquiring information is helpful with our Buddhist practice, is helpful with meditation. But it's not the only way. And nor is it have to be the predominant way. There's so many different ways in which we might listen to a Dharma talk or just approach the Dharma in general. So one way that also this cognitive uh, really intellectualized um, approach may also approach uh, listening to Dharma talks is not only trying to figure it out, but also there might be this little niggling thought, okay, it, surely it's not really that simple. It must be more complicated. So this always this thinking that there's like there's got to be more here. This idea of mindfulness just being with um, our experience. Surely that can't be enough. <laughs> Pay attention to one's breath. Surely there's there's got to be more. That there. That doesn't seem snazzy enough. So there's this way in which we might be tempted to substitute knowledge for practice. Thinking that if we require information or thinking that we have to figure it out. But there's a way in which practice can be actually really simple really simple. One way we might think about it is um, maybe can be demonstrated uh, with this simile. Perhaps some of you are familiar with this simile that's uh, in the suttas. So we might, and the Buddha tells the story as a way to make a point, that suppose there's a crowd of people who are watching a performance, a really beguiling uh, interesting performance and their attention is there and maybe there's a in my mind there's like an upbeat mood maybe there's a yeah there's just like a a um and in my mind it's kind of like you know you know sometimes we see concerts rock and roll concerts or something like this pop concerts so there's these people that are what happily watching a performance and then we can imagine that you have been instructed to carry a bowl of oil on your head and to walk through the crowd towards the stage without dropping the oil from the bowl. And just to make it a little more interesting, there's a person behind you with a sword that will cut off your head if uh, one, any drop of oil falls. It's a little bit outrageous even to imagine this. But the Buddha is pointing to, this is one way we might consider mindfulness practice. That is, if you're going to walk with a bowl of oil on your head, that there and there's like some hustle and bustle going around uh, around you and people are paying attention to the performance not to you that means you need to have some mindfulness you need to be aware 
and to be aware of your posture so that you remain balanced. But there also needs to be some flexibility and some agility and to be aware of what's going around, but around you, maybe not so much that you like are turning your head to look and see everything, but in a way in which maybe your awareness is kind of broad. So it has to be like really embodied with a sense of agility or a sense of flexibility and stability to walk through this crowd with a bowl of oil on your head. And then you might consider that the sword, the person with the sword on the, that's going to chop off your head, is more pointing to the, to be sustained, to have this sustained mindfulness. So it's not to be upright with good posture and balanced in a sense of agility once or twice, but the entire time you're walking towards this stage. And it, I'm imagining, I don't know, but I'm imagining in the Buddha's time, maybe um, it wasn't so unusual to walk with a bowl of a, or walk with anything on your head. So maybe they, it's not, it doesn't have the same degree of difficulty that it might for us. But the, again, pointing to this sense of embodiment and awareness. So if this were to be a simile that points to practice, we could say, well, actually, in some ways, the practice is simple. Be aware and stay balanced. Be aware and stay balanced. But we might also hear about some of this this person in the sword, in the back of us with a sword. <laughs> and we can, might consider there would be some tension and some tightness about this, not flexibility or agility or something like this. So maybe to bring in another visual. You know, sometimes we can understand things with a visual, with similes and stories. And even though Buddhist, Buddhism and Buddhist practice certainly has a lot of lists, there's also these stories and these visual things. So that's a little bit what I'd like to use today. So here's a, another visual that there is a, a monastic who is feeling really discouraged and feels like they want to leave the, the monastery, want to disrobe. And this person was, in, before they became a monastic, would play the lute. We can think of the lute as a proto-guitar. It's in the guitar family, perhaps. And so when the Buddha hears that this person, Sona, wants to leave the monastery and disrobe, he goes to Sona and says, So Sona, you were a lute player, right? Yes, venerable sir. Well, when the string was too loose, did it sound good? No, venerable sir. Well, what about when the string was too tight? Did it sound good? No, venerable sir. So in the same way, tune your level of effort so that it's just right. In the same way that you would tune the strings of a guitar so it has the right sound. Like tune the level of effort. That is to not be too tight and striving and straining and not to be too lackadaisical. And one thing that's nice about the simile of the lute is if we think about the lutes have more than one string, I don't know exactly how many, but that when we know with guitars that when you tune one string, then you tune other strings to that string. So that everything comes into harmony. So you can pay attention in particular to one string and then everything else it becomes a little bit easier to tune all the others. So to pay attention to the 
the amount of energy, the amount of effort. And maybe one way that is an indicator for how much effort one is applying is your reaction when the bell rings at the end of a meditation period. When the bell rings and there's a sense of, ah, <laughs> then that's a sign that there's a little bit too much tightness and maybe too much straining or a little bit too much, uh, a sense of white knuckling it till the end of the period, the meditation period. So we need to tune our energy. We need to have some agility. But also maybe to emphasize this sense of um, maybe a little bit of movement. Here's a, one other simile. Or I'm sorry, this isn't a simile. This is a little story in which a deva, this is a unembodied being, comes to the Buddha and says, Dear Sir, how did you cross the flood? And we could use the word flood to represent all kinds of things. But without um, saying anything specific, we know that floods are generally undesirable, that they kind of like destroy things in their path and are, have a lot of power and are maybe the, you know, the product of torrential rains or something. Dear sir, how did you cross the flood? I cross the flood by not halting and not straining. And the deva says, but how, by not halting and by not straining, did you cross the flood? And the Buddha responds, when I came to a standstill, I sank. And when I struggled, I got swept away. So to not do anything, to sink, but to put forward a lot of effort, a lot of energy, struggling, fighting, is to get swept away in this torrential flood. To not find a way across, but to be susceptible to the, the energy of the flood itself. So there's, these are some visuals in which we might understand practice, where we can might really simplify practice be aware and stay balanced. I heard this from another Dharma teacher. Be aware and stay balanced. So what does this mean, stay balanced? I talked about this a little bit in the guided meditation. One way is with our posture. Whether we're sitting or walking or whether we're moving. I guess you don't worry about your posture so much when you're lying down in terms of being balanced, but it's really worthwhile to spend some time learning which kind of uh, seating equipment is best and, and to really learn is our, our, our ears over our shoulders and sometimes having to tuck the chin a little bit so that it opens up a little space in the back of the neck so that the spine has a real sense of uprightness and allows the arms to just hang. But as we are sitting, we might notice during meditation, if we have this intention to check our posture, we might notice that sometimes there's a certain amount of leaning. It can be leaning forward, maybe not, maybe not so much literally, but maybe kind of like figuratively leaning backwards. This kind of like a push and a pull, a sense of a push and a pull that we feel in the body as well as we feel in the mind. But this leaning, we can maybe, if we notice that we're leaning, might be an encouragement to, to, to inquire, well, what are we placing our attention on? What are we aware of? Because sometimes our minds fixate on what we want or what we don't want. And then this kind of um, causes us to lean, either li literally or figuratively, this push or pull. 
But mindfulness practice is to be aware of this, this preoccupation with what we want or with what we don't want. As of course it's a natural human impulse to be preoccupied, preoccupied with these things and trying to fix them. But we can be aware of our mental state rather than just letting them continue like unchecked, but to be aware and stay balanced is to notice when are we a little bit out of balance. So to be leaning towards something, to be wanting something, to have desire for something, it's not inherently problematic. We, we all have the desire to eat when we're hungry. We have the desire to care for and protect those people we love. We have a desire for the world to be a better place. We have a desire for practice and to find more freedom, experience more freedom. So desire by itself isn't inherently problematic, but this, our practice is about becoming aware and being able to distinguish between skillful and unskillful desire. A desire that leads to more and more freedom or the desire that lends to getting tangled up and leading to less freedom. So practice isn't about getting rid of all desire. Even though sometimes I have heard some Buddhist teachings that made me think that perhaps it was, but this recognition of what's skillful and what's unskillful. Sometimes we can notice that by whether we feel out of balance or not. And if we notice that we're a little bit of out of balance with um, our desire, one thing we can do is to take a careful look at the object of our desire, the actual thing or the situation, and to just do this gentle inquiry, are we seeing it accurately? Chances are when we have a lot of desire, we're just seeing all the beautiful aspects, all the attractive aspects. But everything has, you know, it's not, a, the chances are that something is 100% beautiful. It's not high. So can we see the fullness? Can we see some of the unattractive aspects of whatever we're desiring? And can we take a, and imagine, will this really fulfill these expectations that I have? And asking that question, ask us, well, what are our expectations that we have for whatever it is that we're desiring? And then that kind of brings us back to our own experience. So there's the object. Well, it, is it really as beautiful and perfect as we're imagining? And what is my experience? Both what are my expectations and how does it feel to be desiring? How does it feel to be like leaning, this uh, pulling, being pulled towards something? And it might be really subtle this way that we're maybe a little bit off balance in a subtle way. So to simplify the practice, to be aware and stay balanced, one way that we might be out of balance is because we're filled with desire. And of course, the flip side of that is aversion. This mild or maybe even really strong dislike or really sense of, I don't want this. And just like with desire, there are healthy forms of aversion. And in some ways it might even be a kindness to turn away from some things that are painful. And there are times also when we're just, for so many different reasons, not quite ready to work with some particular difficulties or have that particular difficult conversation so we feel like, okay, it's the time isn't quite right. And that's perfectly natural. So not 
every single time that there's an aversion, there's a turning away, doesn't mean that it's bad. And again, practice is about learning to discern when is it helpful and when isn't it helpful. But aversion also can um, be mixed in with a little bit of hostility and have some ill will. That, of course, is not helpful. And it's when we're a little bit out of balance. So this kind of a push, maybe like a really strong pushing away. So to work with this, can we just be with this aversion or ill will without trying to fix it? Can we just notice, oh yeah, that's what's happening right now. I'm aware this is what's happening. I'm aware I'm a little bit out of balance. And then sometimes when we're just bringing awareness, some open-hearted awareness, we come back into balance. Also, similar to desire, when we're the uh, invitation is to look really closely at the object and to see, is this really going to satisfy our expectations? So maybe when there's some aversion, maybe to do a little bit of an imagination. How would you feel if you acted out your aversion? Your ill will. Maybe there'd be some regret. Maybe there'd be some remorse. Or maybe there's a sense of, oh yeah, okay, the wise thing to do here is not to get tangled up with that but to come back here to center. So to just check in and to use our imagination about A, it's the objects, as well as B, how we feel. And just to notice also, how does it feel to have aversion? There's often a real sense of tightness and constriction and a sense of maybe collapsing or it's not a, it's the opposite of open and spacious and then also we don't want to have aversion towards aversion because that just perpetuates aversion so is there a way and that we can just recognize and allow ah yes here's aversion i'm a little bit off balance here because i have some aversion So that's one way that kind of this leaning maybe that literally or metaphorically might be one way we're a little bit out of balance. But another way it might be kind of like energetically. That is there might be this like a lot of restlessness. There might be a sense of we want to jump up and run away. Or maybe there's a sense of um, ping pong balls uh, inside that are bouncing around. So this agitation or maybe a real scatteredness in the mind can't really settle anywhere. Or there are also this kind of, there can be a really subtle way in which the mind is like quietly searching for something more interesting. So rather than kind of like landing on the object like the breath, Instead, there's this kind of like this probing, this looking, this looking for what's next, what's next. Maybe a type of foraging or something like this. It can be a really subtle type of restlessness. Which maybe feels, I don't know if I would use the word out of balance because it's very subtle, but it is out of balance when you compare it to the experience of just really being here, like completely here with our experience. And so when we have this restlessness, we might again use our imagination to work with it. One thing that uh, sometimes I like to do is to imagine stepping into a cathedral I was um, in Rome. Uh, it's now quite a long time ago. 
But I remember that sense of awe of stepping into this magnificent cathedral, these really high ceilings and the, just the sense of space. So it's not that the restlessness has to go away, but now that same energetic feeling, but in a big space, it's a way that kind of like is a sense of calming. It can be a sense of settling, like there's room for the restlessness to be. So that's one way to work with restlessness. Another way it might be to kind of like zoom in and how does it feel in the body? And to just really get curious about the, the jaggedy feeling that goes with the restlessness. And then of course, energetics, the opposite of restlessness, is a sense of dullness in the mind, in the body, a sense of maybe collapsed energy, a sense of just not enough energy and maybe kind of like literally or figuratively collapsing, not enough energy to sit up, not enough energy to really be with the objects, but instead just kind of a foggy, detached way. So this like maybe so maybe there might like an absence of vitality as a way to describe it. And it might show up in our mind as just kind of retreating a little bit from what we're wanting to pay attention to, rather than arousing just enough energy to pay attention. And when we find ourselves in this, I might call it sloth and torpor, when we find ourselves with this, we might investigate what's underlying it. Often there's there's been a not quite paying attention that there's been some discontent, a bit of aversion, some boredom, which is also a little bit of aversion. Maybe there's also just some physical tiredness from the body not being half enough sleep. Or maybe sometimes there might be some of this shutting down or lack of vitality when there's some really difficult emotions that we don't quite feel ready or capable to be with. And so there can be this collapsing. So we can really simplify our practice without having to use exclusively kind of like thinking about it, but to use imagery and use experiences in the body to be aware and stay balanced. And we might use this idea of balance in our posture as a way to point when we're a little bit off balance. And we can discover ways to come back into balance, but first is to just recognize, oh yeah, I'm leaning, or I'm bouncing, <laughs> or I'm collapsing. And kind of like use the kinesthetic, somatic experience as a way to point to when we're a little bit out of balance. And of course, the more we are in balance, the more we can respond appropriately, not only to what's actually happening to us, but what's happening to others, so that we may be able to support others and help them. So in this way, our practice can be a benefit not only for ourselves, but for others. Thank you.